With my earnings, I hired several efficient hands to assist me and entered into contracts for the transportation of large rafts of timber from Lake Champlain to Troy. Wow, that was a clip uh, from a movie that I really enjoyed uh, called 12 Years a Slave. And in that movie, I was able to be reacquainted uh, with an actor. Um, he had done other things since then, but everything he's done has always fascinated me from when I first saw him in um, Amistad. I was a big Amistad fan uh, because I know Debbie Allen, who's a citizen of Sway in the Morning, uh, was one of the producers on the film, and I thought Steven Spielberg was very smart for bringing her in. He played at that time James Covey, um, who was a translator. Um, and I thought, who is this kid with all of this e electricity on his screen? Uh, since then, he's done. The, uh, went to go do a litany of work that I, I liked extremely. DB, I'm going to let you run that down for me. Okay, let me think. Uh, Inside Man, when he played Denzel Washington's partner, mm -hmm. one of my favorite heist movies, I guess you could say, put in that category. Worked with Spike Lee on that one as well. Uh, he starred in Doctor Strange with his good friend Benedict Cumberbatch. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the films that sticks out of my mind is when he starred in Love Actually because, damn it, yeah. Andrew Lincoln did him so dirty. <laughs> he got married, and then the guy shows up and does this big romantic gesture, and the woman's like secretly falling in love with the guy behind his back. I mean, it was just, it was tragic, man. I, I, to this day, I think it, you, you just, you need to get revenge on Andrew for that, so. Um, <laughs> That's his buddy, too. Yeah, I know, uh, yeah. Uh, but, but I mean, yeah, he's, he's been in a, a ton of great films, and now he's got this film, which he made his directorial debut. He mm -hmm. also wrote, and he's starring in, based on a, a, the life of an actual person, and he's here right now with us, uh, Chiwetel Gio 4. It is, hey. man. Chiwetel Gio 4. Great to be here. Man, your name in itself is so powerful to me. You know what I mean? What does it mean? It means God brings in Igbo. Good brings? God. 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 Oh, God brings. Oh, okay. God, God, brings. Uh, God brings in Igbo. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm going to start. I know we're going to walk up to the boy who harnessed the wind. Okay. Um, I'm curious because last night I was watching the Oscars, and a lot of the commentary and the speeches people talked about was storytelling mm. you know that you know it's so important that we tell the stories that we very seldom hear uh when i look at your body of work i really feel like you're very i don't know if you're selective at what you do but you've always found your way to great stories what was it about Amistad? was it the story or was it the work that made you want to do that i mean it was it was all of it i was 19 yeah. at that time and um uh, I was in drama school uh -huh. in, in London, and so the idea of working with Spielberg was just, <laughs> I mean, I, I, I couldn't even conceive uh -huh. of something uh, of that nature. And I was auditioning because, you know, we weren't really allowed to audition when you're in drama school. Uh -huh. uh, but they had let us, you know, some of us auditioned, a few of us, you know, we were, some of us were asked to, to go there. And... Um, and they'd let it happen because they just thought it'd be good auditioning practice. You know, mm -hmm. neither them nor I thought that it was even possible to, that I'd get the part. And so, um, so that was an incredible thing to happen. And then the story of the Amistad Africans yes. and James Covey and um, and that entire time was uh, just a rich, an incredibly rich opening and understanding of some of the specifics. I hadn't, I didn't know about the Amistad Africans. I didn't know okay. that story uh -huh. uh, at 19. And so it was an amazing introduction to even those dynamics and yeah. the kind of nuances of those dynamics and, uh -huh. uh, and all, of, all of the people that were involved. Um, you know, right up into the president and, uh, you know, Calhoun, all yeah. of those kind of cast of characters. Uh -huh. um, so, yeah, it was an exceptional time. Really I'm, interesting. I'm, I'm thinking of you at night. It was a powerful movie. I, I, you know, and it came out at a um, real great time, like in the late 90s. I remember what's going on in the late 90s. And I'm thinking of you as a 19 year old kid. Like I got a 20 year old daughter. Right. <laughs> you know, yeah. and I, I, I know what's going on in her mind right, right. now. Who at that is that where you became friends with Idris and uh, or yeah that's, yeah, that's where through the acting circles or was yeah, it like in fact was it, that was the day Idris always likes to say that we started our careers on the same day because uh -huh. I met him for the first time at that audition. Oh, oh wow! wow. So, <laughs> so that was you know that was a while ago now. That was twenty something years 20 ago. Twenty something years. Um, yeah, so um, so that's where we sort of started you know started working, started hanging out, and uh -huh. um, developed a friendship from there. Um, I was watching um, the the Oscars last night, and, and I've never sat and watched the Oscars for, for that long. My, <laughs> my, my, the full my, entirety. I swear I haven't. Uh, uh, 
my daughter <laughs> does Oscar nights. So she wanted to do Oscar night with me. And it, it just really opened up for a lot of great conversation. I did feel like we saw a lot more diversity and inclusion um, this year, uh, which I think went well. Uh, Spike Lee, who I know you did Inside Man with, is a friend of mine. You know, I host a lot of parties with him, but he's a mentor of mine. Mm. I felt like he got snubbed in 92 with the X movie, um, when I, the Malcolm X movie. Um, last night I was happy that he won an Oscar for... Best Adapted Screenplay. Uh, but he wanted the Oscar for... Best Picture. He did not win that Oscar. For you Best know, Picture. No, he did not win that Oscar for the Black Klansman. Sure. Uh, this is what he had to say. I'm no a snake bit. I mean, every time somebody's driving somebody, I lose. <laughs> Throw his court side at the garden. The ref made a bad call. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> you gotta laugh at it. It's just a spike. <laughs> that's, that's Go spike. Next. Yeah, but the uh, the Green Book ended up. Uh, so Green Book, yeah. yeah, Green Book won, won for Best Picture and Best Original Screenplay. So it's kind of like it. it, it mm. I mean, obviously, the film industry has issues. You know, when it comes to diversity and, inc- and, and inclusion, um, is it the same way overseas in London? You know. For you guys, is that something that you guys ever discuss as young actors, the disparity of inclusion and diversity? Yeah, I mean, of course. It, yeah. yeah, you know, we have uh, we have a lot of those issues. They, they, you know, and they manifest some of it in the same way. Yeah. Some of it in, in different ways. Some of it is not, in, you know, some of it's not discussed as well. You yeah. know, um, you know that what, what's great about what's happening here as well is that these issues are right on the table and uh-huh. everybody's engaging with these issues and they're talking about it. And things are changing. You know, things are kind of catching up and uh-huh. that's and that's very important you know you know in the UK we have like i say some of the same conversations but also it's not as fully on the table uh-huh. you know and this and this the solutions aren't as as present sometimes so we've got a, we've got work to do we got work to do right should we tell uh, at Gia 4 I do that good <laughs> Pretty good. Pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty good. I mean, he's been practicing all morning. I'll be honest. I can give you a, 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 a B minus right now, but we're going we're to bring that up. Say it correctly. Say it correctly. Uh, well, it was the Edgio 4 that you uh, you were saying. Edgio 4. Okay, it's Edgio 4. Edgio 4. Yeah. Edgio 4. Chiwetel Edgio 4. Yeah. Chiwetel Edgio 4. <laughs> no, we're getting that's, that's an A plus. Thank you, brother. Okay. But on that note, and speaking about diversity, and also you know the sway flubbing your name, did anyone <laughs> at the beginning of your career try to make a case for you, kind of assimilating and changing your name to make it easier to accept? I, yeah, but I mean, people did did mention that, and I uh, and the way it was sort of categorized to me. Which was that you know basically if I kept my name as it was it would it, I would be pushed into playing African parts is mm. what somebody said to me mm. African parts like parts on the continent to which I was like that <laughs> sounds pretty good I mean yeah. <laughs> wrong with that right, 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 right. I'm excited about exploring that option <laughs> mm-hmm. so if that's what's going to happen let's go with it right uh, um, and so I was yeah so that's that's kind of, and I like my name. So yeah. I, I was I was very happy to to stick with it, and I couldn't think of anything else in a way. So there we are. Yeah, it fits, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I want to talk about this movie, The Boy Who Harnessed the Wind, and I actually um, uh, looked up the main character uh, to do some research after seeing the movie. Like, man, let me really find out um, who this guy is. Uh, it's a story about William Conquamba, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Who is William? So William Kamkwamba, when he was about 13 years old mm-hmm. in 2001, 2002, was living in a small area, a small village called Wimbe in, mm-hmm. in Malawi, in this wider region called Kasungu. And what had happened was in this area, there had been a flooding that year, heavy, heavy rainfall le- leading to flooding, and then subsequently a drought. Uh-huh. So they had it, the, the community was sort of hit by a double whammy. What that meant was there was going to be a food shortage from that harvest. Now, the government sort of turned their back on this, on this community uh-huh. as they started to, to run out of food. And so they began to kind of hunker down and prepare for the worst. William was in secondary school at the time, and uh, was, uh, secondary school isn't free in Malawi, so he was brought out of school by his, by his parents, you know, to save the money to go, to go on grain. Grain prices were going through the roof. Uh-huh. Um, and so he ended up 
you know, trying to sneak into the school. He wanted to, to learn to continue his studies. He ended up trying to sneak into the school. He, he was able to sneak into the school library uh -huh. in, in this area. And, um, and he found an American textbook in the school library. And that book was called Using Energy. And on the front of it was the image of a windmill. Okay. So he got it into his mind that what he was going to do was use any kind of scrap metal he could find, any, anything he could find, and the book and the sort of the science and engineering technology that it were in the book. Uh -huh. And uh, and use his kind of ingenuity to try and build a wind turbine, with which he was going to irrigate the land, uh -huh. you know, by generating electricity for a water pump, and get them all out of the famine. And so that's what he that's what he began uh -huh. to try and how, achieve. And how old was he? He was thirteen. That's 13 the you, you, that's the that's miracle. The hook. And, and he was using s scraps like bicycle parts, yeah. uh, uh, metal PVC metal. piping, anything yeah. he could find from junkyards uh -huh. uh, that would just that would been anything discarded that he could try and you know club together uh -huh. uh, to um, to try and build his wind turbine. He um, he ended up writing a book about his experience, uh -huh. uh, which I saw, which I read in in two thousand and nine. And, uh, and I was just deeply inspired by his story, his story of tenacity, of optimism, of just never giving up, of science, technology, education, uh -huh. all of these kind of themes, you know, wider themes, climate change, government responsibility, all of these kind of ideas, um, up and to and including geopolitics, yeah, you know, geopo democ yeah. you know, democracy, you know, what, how the world is looking at the, at the sort of impoverished community, how they're at the, the thin end of the wedge, the, uh -huh. the pointy end of the stick uh -huh. when it comes to climate change. These are the most vulnerable communities are going to be the first to be hit and are being hit right now uh -huh. by you know, people who rely on a consistency of climate. You know, these are the communities that are being hit by the actions of others, the actions of us. You know. So uh, all of those things were, were just you know, deeply inspiring to me, his story. Oh. It's, it's a powerful movie. Um, he went on to receive an education and got his um, degree in environmental studies. At Dartmouth. Right, at Dartmouth um, here in the United States, right? Uh, as a writer and director, what, what, one of the things I noticed when DB and I was watching the film is how precise you stuck to customs and traditions when it came to garb or when it when it came to ceremonies. Mm. Um, where did you study that, and, and did you have a consultant for that? Yeah, I mean, I when I I went out to Malawi, I I sort of adapted the first draft of the of the book. Uh, just using the book, uh -huh. you know? and so um, uh, so I wanted to go out after that first draft to try and get my own sense of Malawi, my own sense of the place, my own sense of the people, and so I went to visit William Kamkwamba and his family. He was very generous with me and just sort of took me around that whole community, uh -huh. and I got to start to spend some time with his parents, with his sisters, and then you know, just in the kind of wider context of being in Malawi and understanding some of its culture, some of its roots, some of its traditions, its uh -huh. rich, uh, rich cultural tradition. I, my background is obviously Nigerian, so there was, you know, there's no generic Africa, so there was some, but there are some similarities, you uh -huh. know, in the kind of rural communities and how those systems work, but there are massive distinctions as well. And so I was just trying to find out what the specifics of those were so uh -huh. I could represent the people of Malawi and this story with an authenticity, you uh -huh. know, the, uh, with a very specific cultural authenticity to the place. I think you were successful at that. <laughs> All right, <laughs> DB. Yeah, so uh, I, you've probably never heard of this guy, but there's this rapper named, uh, 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 what's the guy from uh, from Brooklyn that we just had? <laughs> Jesus, I just had a brain fart. Casanova? Casanova, Casanova. thank you. <laughs> Casanova did a song with uh, a why, guy. Why you assume you wouldn't know Casanova? You're a hip-hop head, right? I don't know. Okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> well done, DB. Thank you. So uh, Casanova recently collaborated on a song with a guy named DeVito from Africa. And he came up here and he told us about when he went to Africa and DeVito showed him around the town. He also took him to like the poorest of the poorest places like poverty that we couldn't even imagine here in the States. You know, he was saying how some of these huts, you know, we think we live in the projects, but it'd be like a condo compared to what you see down in, in some of the poorest parts of Africa. But he also said that no matter how poor these people were living, and in, in the same in the village of Wimbe that you see in the film, people are washing with you know well water and things like that. But they were so happy, and you would see love and things like that. So, did you kind of come away with that same sort of sense of valuing certain things that before you may have took for, for granted? Totally. I mean, I think that we have a perspective on poverty, you know, in the Western world that is not necessarily 
accurate, you know, and there's not, a, and there's sometimes a kind of imposition on the psychology of poverty, you know, that there is uh, no poverty of the spirit, you know, and these mm. cultures and communities and the depth of these communities, the richness of these communities, the kind of interpersonal and family and familial dynamics are so complex, so rich, so full. You know, when you're in a village, you know, either in Malawi, but certainly in my case, I spent a lot of time growing up going to the villages in Nigeria and, and, and meeting, you know, my family, extended family and, you know, sort of deep, deep wells of family and tradition and those kind of understandings. And the village community from the outside, certainly from a Western point of view, just kind of look very, they look very poor, you know, and they look very sort of rudimentary and, and very basic. But actually, as you start to get under the hood and start to understand those communities, when you get inside and see that point of view, you know, you realize that these are incredibly rich, complex, historically deep places, you know, um, full of very incredible people and a, and a deep support network, you know. So you realize actually that there is a kind of fundamental heartbeat in this experience. And that's some of what I wanted to explore and really sort of start to show that it's not, that if you can look inside the experience, if you can sort of somehow be placed inside of it, you, you might start to look at that kind of context, the African village trope, if you like, okay. quote unquote, in a, in a slightly different way, in a sort of more sophisticated way. Right, man. Rich Nice, you got one? Yeah. Great answer. Um, wind energy is so important in Africa, you know, besides making them self-sufficient, you know, besides finance. Um, but there's stories of sabotage to prevent disempowerment. Have you um, witnessed that in the process of this film, or did you hear of any of the uh, sabotage to prevent disempowerment with these windmills? I mean, I didn't really see a sort of direct sabotage of, of that. I know that there is always um, a conversation that goes on, you know, between... The, uh, the sort of much more kind of you know, economic, sort of neoliberal infrastructural desire, if you like, to bring infrastructure and charge people for it. You right. know? So in the sense of, well, if you know, providing electricity so that then some government agency gets paid for providing the electricity as opposed to everybody then having their own sources of electricity. And that can be, uh, can be a tension. It certainly was a tension around the time that William Kamkwamba was telling his story mm -hmm. initially, but it wasn't something that I witnessed, and I don't think it's something that is very, that is very strongly uh, a strong sort of motivating factor for governments. I think that people creating and engaging in independent energy sources is something that I think people will get behind. You know that I, I think it's very important for obviously for these for these communities, and if governments aren't providing those things uh, necessarily on a consistent basis right. or, or or charging highly for it, which leaves a lot of people out, you know, then. Um, then the, the onus and the responsibility is on the people in those communities as well with outside help to kind of find ways of identifying the issues that they face and being supported in, in rectifying those, those, those solutions, you know, and, and gaining those solutions. That's what William did. He lived in the solution to, mm. to the problems that he was facing. And I, and I feel like that's the future for a lot of these communities. You know, William himself is building an, a, an innovation center in Lilongwe, which is the capital of Malawi. And that, again, is to do that thing. That is to to work with young people mm -hmm. who are identifying themselves, identifying the issues that they face in their community, and working with him and people that he brings into that innovation center to find and organize solutions that they also are an inherent part of running and sustaining the solutions to the problems that they see and that they identify mm -hmm. in their communities. And I, it strikes me that that's a very empowered way of dealing with some of the challenges, the huge challenges mm -hmm. That, that people face, you know, in some of these in some of these communities. Mm. I like that, man. The right. boy who harnessed the wind is on uh, Friday, uh, March the first. We have Kevin on the line from Virginia. Good morning, Kevin. Hey, Kevin. Kev, Kev. Good morning, 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 Sway. Good morning, everybody. How y'all doing? What's doing up, great, bro? man. You got a question? Uh, Mr. Yeah, uh, Mr. I just wanted, to, uh, Mr. Ezra for uh, how you doing, sir? I'm good. How you say, doing? Uh, besides what. I'm doing good, doing good. Um, besides 12 Years a Slave, one of my favorite movies you did, 2008, Red Belt. You played a character, Mike Terry. Mm. Um, you, you, um, th that movie is one of my favorites because I started taking martial arts when I was 13. I like the way you embodied the discipline, the spirit that a martial artist should have and, and the integrity martial arts should have, with, um, especially with, with all of the... the um, tournament fighting that goes on i just like the way you portrayed the the character and also the spirit and the um 
the honor in uh, martial arts as well. Great, it was a great performance. A lot of people don't talk about that movie you did, but I really, really love that movie. I love it. Great Thank you. Was- Thanks so much, man. Thank you so much. I still have some of those skills, you know. Where- <laughs> But you got to you got to attack me in the correct sequence of moves. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> got to be choreographed, right? <laughs> uh, you know, uh, we we usually for our first time guests we we come up with a game, man. A, 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 which one? A, a game. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So we, we came up with a game. It's kind of a play on your name. Okay. I All right. And and the game is called Chew it, Tell the Truth. He's an Oscar-nominated actor, a director, a writer. He's worked with Hollywood's elite. So let's get to know this guy a little bit better. We want to hear Chiwetel the truth right now on Sway in the morning. All right. Okay, man. You got to answer these questions honestly, transparently. You can't not run from these questions. Okay. All, All right, right. Here we go. Here we go. Number one, have you ever been starstruck by anybody? Uh, have I ever been starstruck? I feel like I've been starstruck a load of times. You know, like I feel like I'm always getting starstruck. I think that the most impactful time of being starstruck was definitely on Amistad. I mean, yeah. I was kind of, there were just people wall to wall that I was. Anthony kinda, Hopkins. Yeah, Morgan Freeman. Yeah. There was Spielberg himself. You know, there was just a kind of, you know, that's, that just to be in that space, to be suddenly teleported into that, that kind of world. I was I was freaked out. It's okay, man. <laughs> Understandably, it's so. okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm only we're just still, over it, to yeah, be honest you're with really you. Really, okay. Twenty well, something years. Yeah. If you were flat broke and needed to borrow money, who would you call first? Who I'd call my brother first. Okay. I would call my brother first. What's yeah. he do? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I would call him for advice on who to ask to get the oh, money yeah, from. Yeah, 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 good yeah, question, okay, Tracy. Good question. <laughs> Brother. All right, if you were producing a movie and needed a celebrity cameo but didn't have the money in the budget to pay them, who would you call for a favor? If I was producing a movie but I needed a celebrity cameo? Yeah. Um I don't know. I always think that Chris Rock would be up for doing yeah. for just 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 jumping in and just saying, "You know what? I'll just throw something down for you." And uh, I don't know. He has that kind of face. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he Not most sure. likely say no, face. but he seems right. to me like he might be like, "Got it, got it, got it." Okay, best advice someone gave you. The best advice I was ever given was uh, was do not engage in crisis management. I don't know. That always struck me as really do good. Do not engage but in crisis management. Do not engage in crisis management. Take time to deal with one particular issue at a time. There you go. Word to the wise. Shit, that was game. Damn, this whole interview was worth that moment. No, I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm just joking with you. All okay, right, man. But last but, question, last question. Have you ever turned down a role that you later regretted? Never happened. Never. Never. Not once. You never turned down a role? (laughs) 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 Yeah, even the worst script I read was right on the money, man. It it actually just worked out great. Okay. (laughs) All right, man. Man, it was an honest, honest honor to meet you this morning and have you, you on this show, man. True would tell as before. Thank you. Did hey. I say it right? Yeah, pretty, I, I right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It just yeah, means you gotta come back. <laughs> that means you have to come back, man. Tutorials, tutorials. Well, you, you're gonna be doing Scar, right? That's right. You're doing the voice right. of Scar. That's right. 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 That's like one of my favorite animations of all time. Well, it is an amazing an In the amazing cast. Yeah. Beyonce's in there, too. That's true. Don't mess this up, dog. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Make sure you watch it on Netflix. Um, in theaters this Friday, The Boy Who Harnessed the Wind. Incredible movie. Especially if you come from a, in, in a dis- disenfranchised community, it's a, it gives you a lot of hope. You know, and the, the main character is living today. Mm-hmm. All right? So look him up. All right? Thank you for coming by. Pleasure. Up, Thank you. Absolutely. Up next, we got the legendary, iconic DJ Red Alert. Woo! 